Okay, I'm Infinite Reality, so are you, and so is everybody else. And today I want to talk about just this article I came across a couple of minutes ago. It says, this week in finance, banks and, banks and iron ore are the barbell weighing down the ASX, while Rio Tinto has a tricky choice. Uh, <clears throat> first off, I, I just want to say, uh, banks are, are, are a uh, noose around everyone's neck, you know, and the simple fact is, if we owned all our iron ore, coal, uh, anything that we pull out of the ground, uranium, uh, we would be the richest country in the world, okay? But the fact is, we sell all these things off to other countries, other corporations, and they they never get seen. So let, let's hit this article, okay? With little inspiration to be drawn from the, the flat end to the week on Wall Street, ASX futures traders took a punt that this week might start a little higher. But then again, it was neither a very big nor convincing bet. And they've gone into the markets on Friday. Okay, you know, look, 75 cents U to US cents to the Australian dollar, that's pretty standard. Uh, you know, there, I, I can only remember one period in the last 10 years, and that was a couple of years ago, where we were almost parity dollar for dollar with the US cent. So... You know, it's back to normal for us, I think. So, I'm not even going to touch that. Uh, the ASX, ASX had a poor week compared to its peers. Fell 1% while the US edged up. Europe moved down and China was the pick of the bunch, up 3%, helped by its partial inclusion in the MSCI index from next May. Huh. Look... <sighs> What do you want me to say about this stuff? Uh, I, I I think I, I I elucidated in it in the first uh, video that it's all backed on confidence. You know, now if China's using more of our coal and using more of our iron ore, then things are going to start going up for us. But when they don't, because at, right at the moment China's the biggest user of all this stuff. Uh, it affects our economy big time, and it's just a it's a game here. Okay, Australia's cause was not helped by the barbell nature of its index, with the huge weights of banks and resources at either end. With the banks facing numerous challenges, now the states are taxing them, and the sentiment for commodities still poor. It is difficult to see where the investment lift will come from. Well, this is what happens when you sell off anything that's valuable in your country. And we've done that. Uh, my, my uncle used to live about 8 kilometers away from the biggest open-cut coal mine in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this thing was fully owned by Japan. Uh, and if, if you want to look into it, it, it was called Yulin Coal Mine. Uh, I don't know what it, they call it now. But that's what it was. And it had a direct uh, train line straight to Newcastle, which uh, from the trains, they put the coal onto a ship. And 
And do you know what Japan did with it? They dumped it in their harbour. Why? Because salt water is a great uh, preserver of coal. Okay? So, they weren't even using it. They're stockpiling it. Now, if anyone wants to, th to, to think on taking on Japan anytime soon, they have the reserves to last them probably 150 years from what I can gather. Okay? So, don't even think twice about touching them. But, we'll, we'll get on. Alright. Uh, Australia's, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the banks facing numerous challenges now that the states are taxing them and the sentiment for commodities still poor, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Right, iron ore prices heading to the low US $40. Well, I wonder why. You know, when you flood a market with something, things get cheaper. I, the oil's the same. There are so many sources for oil at the moment that um, the, the actual international price of it is at all-time low figures, you know? But when you buy it at the Bowser, oh, don't you pay through the arse, you know? How is this legal? Don't ask me. This is a dog and pony show here. Got no idea. Looking at the trade figures, China, China still has a pretty healthy appetite for iron ore. Figures released late last week showed imports in May rose another 6% and are up 8% in the year to date. Iron ore futures gained a tad on Friday and didn't go backwards over the week, while spot prices crept up 2.5 week highs near uh, US $57 a tonne. Look, see see the game they play on us? You know, all of a sudden, this week, you sell a little bit more, and, you know, uh, all of a sudden, the, the, the price, maybe go up a little bit, might go down a little bit, but it really doesn't affect anyone of uh, of importance, to be, uh, except the people that invest in it. You know, and it's a fool's game, to be honest. Really is a fool's game. That is the short-term view. Longer term, the picture is far bleaker, with another raft of downgrading being made, the most bearish from the big broker City, or CITI. CITI has cut its spot price from forecast for 2018 to $50 a tonne, noted in the next six to eight months it could well be mired in the low US $40 range. See, well, who's, who are these people that are dictating these prices? Does anyone ever ask that question? You know, if you're controlling the pricing of these things, who's in control of it? You or the people that are producing it? Really? You know? It, it, this is silly stuff. Uh, I, I've never understood the, 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 uh, the stock market and why people would basically gamble on it. It's a fool's errand. It really is. You know? Because uh, it's only ever designed to make the rich richer. And when the little guy gets involved... He might make a, a couple of gains here and there, but overall, what's it doing for him? Or her? Not much. Okay, CITI's supply balance sheet reflects 100 million tonne surplus in China this year. See, there, there, there's a big problem, right? There's an oversupply of iron ore, right? Uh, when you oversupply something, the prices go down, right? If this was government government owned, they the government could say, "All right, we're not going to sell anywhere near as much iron ore this year 
we're going to stockpile it, right? And wait until the prices are right for us to sell it. But because uh, the government has sold all these stuff to different corporations and different countries around the world, <laughs> that's the big one for me. Um, the, these things are owned by countries, not necessarily corporations. And it's all coming out of our country, our wealth. Okay? Um, and when you do that, well, the, the people that are setting the price dictate every time. Right? Instead of the people that are supplying it dictating. You know, now, if if I went and, I, I'm a carpenter, and if I wanted to build a chair for somebody, do you think I'm going to haggle on the price? Because the simple fact is, I know what it costs me to make that, and I want to make at least 15 to 20% on the top. Some people are very greedy, and they want to make a 100% markup on it. But I'm not a greedy person. I, I I will I'll do it for the cost plus twenty. I'm I'm very happy to do that. Okay, but others aren't because they're all motivated about money. I, I'm motivated in other ways. But when you start doing this stuff, you realise that okay, um, if I'm pro producing something, that means that I I. Um, want to get not only my money back from the materials I put into it, but I, I actually want to make a bit of a profit on it. Right? That's, that's only natural. It's the way things work. But these people, what they want to do is they want to get you to do all the hard work by pulling the stuff out of the ground and then dictate the price. Yeah? Something wrong there, isn't there? Anyway, city's supply balance sheet reflects a 100 million tonne surplus in China this year on top of a 60 million tonne surplus last year. Right, so they've, uh, they've put way too much iron ore into the mix and people are going to dictate the price for them because they just want to keep pulling it out. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And if this was stuff was government run, instead of having private corporations and countries involved, you might be looking at a bit of a different situation here. There is a substantial tailwind in supply with big expansion projects from Brazil's Vale and Gina Reinhardt's Roy Hill hitting their straps. CITOA argues only a price collapse would arrest the flood of iron ore hitting China's already overburdened ports and a price below 45 US dollars a ton is needed to bring the market back into balance. Well, what about the people that are getting shortchanged by producing this? You ever thought about the effects that way? Because, you know, this is a two-ended game here. Supply and demand. When you, when you oversupply something, the, the, the demand drops, and so does the price. So, what do you do about it? Well, you don't supply as much. And there's the big thing, right? You, you should be stockpiling this stuff for when people do demand it, right? But what do we do? Nah, just put it on the open market. Put it on the open market, no worries. You know, uh, and look, <coughs> all these high prices over here is in uh, China's uh, building boom, okay? Uh, once they started building their infrastructure and they had most of it done, and I tell you what, they did that in in record time too. Uh, you should see some of the things that they've done in China over the past 15 years. Unbelievable. But uh, they've done that in record time. And all of a sudden, when they've stopped buying, 
the market's died in the ass. Right? Only now, oh, we need a bit more because we're going to do a bit more. <laughs> the market's rising again. It's silly. Really is silly. You know, um, things like iron ore, uh, when you're digging it out of the ground, it should be done uh, seasonal or when it's needed. You shouldn't be digging it out 24 hours, 7 days a week, right? Because the bottom line is you're not going to make the money out of it next year that you are going to this year. And if you are going to dig out 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, stockpile it. Stockpile it. Don't put out what you pull out. Right? That way, you can actually have a steady market. And, you know, you can even actually make some money on it while you're doing it. Well, I, I, I haven't done any economics. I've done business courses and things, but you know, uh, to me, it's simple, simple supply and demand. Right now, if you're oversupplying, the demand's not there. You're going to lose money on what you're doing. Right. So let's talk about. Uh, these companies, instead of just doing one thing, maybe they should be thinking about doing 20 things. D diversifying. Okay? But it, the, the, the way it affects everybody's stock price in this country is ridiculous. You know? Um, I don't want to be trading at 75 US cents to the dollar each and every week if I wanted to buy something from overseas. It's ridiculous. Why have I got to pay 25 cents more on the dollar than everybody else? Well, it's only because of short-sidedness from the, um, the uh, government. Oh, uh, absolutely short-sidedness from the government that, that these situations happen. You know, as I said, we're we're probably the most research, resource rich country in this world, probably be, uh, besides Africa. Okay, and we don't know how to handle it. We've got a bunch of bozos down in Canberra that uh, think they know what they're doing because they went to an economics class, and they really have no idea. Anyhow, I'll continue. One of the interesting dynamics in this sudden and, and rare divergence between iron ore and steel prices, hot rod coil and rebar prices have remained elevated, largely due to the enforced shutdown of old furnaces. Oh, see, there you go, right? They're even telling you. <coughs> They've shut down certain services, which means that the price of that has remained high. Oh, Shit, wish I'd said that about five minutes ago. You know, when I said uh, they should be uh, mining seasonally. <laughs> but yeah, at the end of the day, they don't have any say in it. They, they sold off these mines long ago. Uh, this government, or not this government, but governments previous. And yeah, they're suffering the consequences of it. Well, we all are. The capacity constraints may keep steel prices higher but a bit longer, but more efficient production is coming in line online which will depress prices eventually. Yeah, well why are you doing it then? Why are you doing it then? It makes no no financial sense at all for anyone for you to be even going there. May as well keep it an elevated price because you're only producing a certain amount of it. You know, uh, greed sort of kicks in here, doesn't it?
you know. The bigger issue is demand. City says growth momentum will slow and still demand with flatline. Yeah, well, of course. Of course. You know, it's with any product. It's all based on supply and demand. And if you don't have the demand for it, what are you going to do with your supply line? Yeah? Long product steel used in real estate and infrastructure sectors has not grown much this year. Steel wire rod or rebar steel. Demand will take a hit if new apartment investments cool. As expected. Yeah, well, as expected because uh, the building bubble uh, from my take is probably about 16 to 17 years overdue in this country to burst. You know, I, I learnt this stuff as a carpenter. Uh, you expected a, a boom and bust cycle every seven years in the building industry in this country. And when it doesn't happen, it means someone's propping it up somewhere, somehow. Okay, and I said, we're that far overdue that it's not even funny. And when it happens, people are going to lose their shit. Let me tell you, it is not a time to be buying anything right now, especially property. But, uh, you know, that's up to you. If you want to go into into debt uh, for buying property for a million dollars that's worth $300,000 at most, that's your problem. Okay. Steel plate production used in shipbuilding machinery surged in the first quarter, but the sustainability of that trend is questionable. Yeah, of course, because how many um, ships did we build here in Australia? Not a great deal. Uh, you know, I, I think the only things that are going is the Navy stuff that I know of. But, you know, that's another story. While a new sales tax on small car engines may slow things there as well. Well, you know, more tax on something that we don't even build in this country anymore. Well done. Hey? Eh? Just let's add add the cost to the to the uh the consumer. Points to flat demand at best and nothing to halt the fall of iron ore prices in an already oversupplied market. Well, yeah, of course. Consensus look at property demand. In another quiet week in the data front, perhaps the most interesting fresh insight will come from the first release of information from the troubled 2016 consensus, or census, sorry. The first cut of census data will focus on housing-related questions. This should enable econ uh, economists to update their estimates of underlying demand for dwellings and the scale of pent-up demand, important given the high levels of residential building occurring in the eastern states, NAB's David DeGara said. Yeah, uh, what can I say about that? Uh, I, I've noticed the trend in Sydney in the past five years in particular that uh, people are getting kicked out of actual homes these days and they'll buy, uh, these property developers will buy your house, the house next door and the two behind and they'll build units. And they'll fit seven to ten units in those blocks, okay? And what they're trying to do is force people to live in ever, ever, ever smalling circles. And it's not something for me. <laughs> uh, when I cash out of the uh, the property market, I'll, I'll be going and and buying myself a five-acre property out of the middle of nowhere. <laughs> that's that's what I'd be doing. You know, uh, living in the city is not good. It's not good. 
you know, uh, the amount of money it just cost you to stay here, let alone the amount of cost uh, it takes to get to work, have something to eat at work, you know, uh, geez, heaven forbid you might get uh, fined for speeding or something on the way, that could be the end of your week's pay packet right there, you know, uh, is it worth it? I don't think it is, but, you know, each to their own. The RBA's private sector credit numbers Friday will be interesting on two fronts. Business lending, which has been weak, and property lending, which is arg arguably has been too strong to investors. Well, absolutely. Um, you've got to understand here... Uh, Banks will throw money at you all day long. Why? Because they know if you don't pay it back, what you've got in property is worth more than what what you owe. Okay, nine times out of ten. And if it doesn't, that's when you have big problems. And this is what's starting to happen now. You know, um some of the properties in some areas that I could mention in, in Sydney are going for far too much at the moment. Far too much. I, as I said, I'm a carpenter. I, I know what it costs to build a house from scratch on a block or a property, you know, and I know what they charge for it too. And they're two separate numbers guarantee it okay and what happens is these people they don't care that they, they will go into debt for 30 40 50 years even uh, that they, they were even talking uh, in the government of um using people's superannuation as a deposit on their homes which is crazy talk absolute crazy talk who wants to actual actually uh, give away what they've worked for just for a deposit on a home. Eh, not me. Anyway. Move in. Move on. Is inflation in the US on the retreat again? Overseas, there'll be a deluge of opinion from Federal Reserve speakers with Chair Janet Yellen in London, while San Francisco President John Williams is booked in for two speeches in Sydney and one in Canberra. However, the key point of interest will be the release of the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, core PCE, personal consumption and expenditure, on Friday. The cons uh, consensus is for another week, number of 0.1% growth month on month down an already unimpressive 0.2% in April. Well, how is the growth when our companies are getting shut down at an alarming rate? In the past five years, we've stopped uh, manufacturing cars altogether in this country. Altogether. There's not one car manufacturer that's willing to to bring their uh, their, their uh, companies down here. So let's just yeah, that's just one area. You know, now imagine that happening across the board with all sorts of things, and you can see growth isn't growth. <laughs> it's not growth at all. You're just manipulating numbers here. Okay, not exactly the numbers of uh, the Fed is looking for in its path to raise interest rates back to something like normal. Now, Rio Tinto's tricky choice. Uh, on the corporate front, the giant Swiss-based commodities trading house Glencore has thrown a curveball at Rio Tinto's plans to dispose of it, coal and allied business to Chinese interests. See? Look, the writing's on the wall. Uh, 
these people don't want to be in that business anymore because they can see how much money they, they can lose by doing what they're doing. So they're willing to sell it, sell it all to Chinese. Okay? Why would they sell it to Chinese? Because they're the biggest users of iron ore in the world. Bar none. Okay? Right, but what does that do for Australians? What happens if the Chinese come in and take over uh, Rio Tinto's um, coal and iron ore and all the rest of the things that Rio Tinto um, have got their dirty little fingers and toes in? What happens if it gets sold off to Chinese interests? Where's that money going? It's not, co it's not coming into our economy. Let me tell you that right now. And this is the big, uh, the big problem. Big problem in Australia. You know, uh, I can even go right down to our utilities, which have all been sold off to uh, private corporations. And we are now paying uh, more for electricity today than we ever did before. Let's not talk about water or anything else important because the same things happen, right? Our, our government's uh, solution to all this problem is, when in doubt, sell it out. Sell it out from under the Australian people. And it's bloody ridiculous. All right, late on Friday, Glencore upped this bid for Rio... Rio's Hunter Valley mines to 2.675 billion, 225 million above the agreed offer from China's Yankol. The assets on block include Hunter Valley operations, the Walkmouth, Mount Thorley thermal and semi soft coking coal mines, and a major stake in the Port Waratah coal loading facility in Newcastle. Um, that's the same loading facility I'm talking about The uh, Yulin Mine has a direct uh, train line to. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you want me to say about this stuff? The, it, this has been going on for years and years and years, right? And you get ABC uh, article here like it's just happened in this week in finance. Hey, no, this hasn't been happening this week. This has been happening time and time again in this country for the past 30 years. The past 30 years. And if you know what's going on and you see it happening, and you see these politicians, they, oh, you know, we'll just sell this, we'll just sell that. You know, um... I think the biggest kickback I've ever seen uh, in Australia about the government wanting to sell something was the the Telstra, the the telecommunications outlet. Right, people got up in arms over that, but you know how they won them over. Oh, if you you know if you were um, a long time Telstra customer. And uh, we'll give you first offer and shares. Well, shit, that seemed to satisfy everyone, that. No one kicked up a stink after that. And a lot of people made some big money early on. But after that, the price went up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, uh, w where is anyone with it? You know, what's its real worth? No one knows. It's a private corporation now. Okay. Uh, Glencore sweetened its bid with the promise of a swift cash settlement and $225 million deposit that would be forfeited if regulators didn't like the idea. Sounds simple, really. The problem for Rio is the risk of upsetting China. Well, shit. Why would why would we be worrying about upsetting China? Well, because that's their biggest 
export market. Like it or not, that's that's what it is. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it indifferent? I don't know. But I, I would like to think that if we started stockpiling this stuff here for a sale at a later date, we wouldn't be having these problems. But because, once again, these are private corporations that, that the government has sold these lands to and these mines and, and everything in it, that we don't have a say. Right? So, once again, the ASX goes up and down, up and down, fluctuates on all everything else but what we do as Australians. It's crazy. And that's my point of making this video today. You know, uh, when are we going to say enough's enough and take some of these things back? And say, hey, no, no more bullshit games here. Uh, we're going to take these back for the people. Because, as I said, if we took them back as the people, for the people, and we uh, decided to say, okay, right, we're going to start stockpiling all this stuff, and we're not going to sell it until the price is right, what would happen? I guarantee the price would go up immediately. Okay? Right, then we can start talking about selling what we need to sell. But it doesn't happen, does it? You know, this is how piss weak our government is. It, well, you know, I, I, I could go into more why the the government's piss weak but maybe that's another story too uh relations between rio and its biggest customer have been somewhat uncomfortable since rio's former head in iron ore in china stern hugh was jailed for 10 years back in 2010 hmm wonder what that was all about i don't know to be honest uh, it's not something that ever come across my radar, but I, I I wonder if it had something to do with fixing prices. Rio's board is com currently mulling over things and will give an update ahead of the planned general meeting in London called on Tuesday to vote on the sale of Yankol. Now, why is this meet meeting in London? Aren't these our bloody... Uh, lands and our iron ore and coal that they want to sell? Why isn't it happening here? Hmm. Another thing to think about, isn't it? If Rio decides to take Glencore's money and run, the meeting will be adjourned without ever starting. The reaction uh, to any snub in China would be interesting. Well, Here's my take on it. I don't give a stuff what China thinks about it. If if we we had full control over all this stuff, China would be begging us, not saying, um, oh, I don't like the way you did that. We're going to punish you because of it. We're not going to start buying your stuff. You know? Uh... This is this is the mess that uh, consecutive governments, uh, right from pretty much uh, Bob Hawke onwards, have gotten us into. And you as Australians need to understand what's going on here, and don't fall for this crap, right? My my advice to you would be, don't play the stock exchange. Why? Because it's all rigged. It really is all rigged. You know, uh, all they need to do to take every cent of your money is to crash any number of interests. 
And it's as simple as that. They do that, you lose. You lose every time. Alright. Uh, cheers. It's the end of my video.